Funding for New Stage for a City has been generously provided by the Prudential Foundation, providing grants to nonprofit organizations helping individuals and communities build the skills they need to be ready to learn, ready to work, ready to live. We believe that this project is the single most important development in the city of Newark this century. On May 2nd, 1993, an explosion rocked downtown Newark and the 71-year-old Military Park Hotel came crumbling to the ground. The crowd watching from the top of the Newark Club were in a festive mood. For them, the implosion was an act of creation, a symbolic moment demolishing not just a building, but a negative image that had engulfed the city for decades. After years of struggle and controversy, it was an explosion of hope, and fairly or unfairly, the hopes for North America's third oldest city were all focused on the building that would rise from this rubble. It's been the most highly visible construction project with public and private money that's taken place in New Jersey in, in my lifetime. A fishbowl like you would not believe. Everybody's been watching this thing, inside Newark and outside. The, the people who wanted it to fail so they could say, I told you so. The people who hate Newark to, so they can say, I'm glad it, everybody's been watching it. From the moment it was first proposed, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center was caught in the limelight of public scrutiny. A $180 million complex on a 12-acre site with two theaters, rehearsal rooms, a restaurant and a cafe, home for the state's symphony orchestra, the American Ballet Theater, and the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater. I'm Itzhak Perlman, and this is a story with a cast of thousands, politicians, CEOs, artists, teachers, socialites and social activists, people from the suburbs and the cities who found common ground in the belief that an arts center could save a city. Their plan was called visionary, naive, a needless extravagance and just plain impossible. Some called the plan a beacon of hope, but many others agreed with a New York columnist who called it the worst decision since Napoleon invaded Russia. To build a performing arts center at a time when the value of the arts is under increasing attack in one of the most troubled cities in the nation, that takes an incredible act of will. You have to be prepared to answer some tough questions. Why build it here? Who will pay for it? Will it really get built? And who will come? Fair questions, perhaps, considering the city's history. It's been a long time since Newark was a major manufacturing Any center good, John, with a prosperous downtown shopping Third district. Crossroad of the state's number one city, Newark. Back in the 40s, actually, Newark had a very vibrant art scene as far as uh, the extension of New York. You had. Uh, Two or three theaters, three theaters with live, um, you know, live acts. You had a, well, you had an opera and a burlesque. You had what the, the Adams Theater, where I saw um, Nat King Cole and Sarah Vaughan and Louis Jordan. When I first discovered bebop, you know, in, in the 40s, you could go down the street. I saw Charlie Parker right on Clinton Avenue, right down the street, at a place called Silver Saddle. What happened is. Um, during the late 50s and 60s, the money was just taken out of Newark Wholesale. Businesses uh, taken out, the whole middle class left, or a great part of them. And the city was sort of left uh, penniless and, and with its kind of uh, infrastructure of culture destroyed. 
Well, if one were to go back to when I came to Newark, which was 1968, this was a nearly devastated town in the central parts of the city, having to do with the, the riots of July 1967. It was certainly spiritually devastated because despite the, the, the many problems facing Newark and its residents, problems that go back to the 1930s and 40s, uh, the riots seemingly caught most people off guard. So there was a sense of shock um, in, in Newark in 67 and 68 when I got here. Those of us who knew something about the Newark Museum or the New Jersey um, Symphony or the New Jersey Ballet or Crossroads Theater or any of the other great artistic uh, venues in New Jersey knew that it wasn't a wasteland, but we also knew that the perception was that New Jersey was a wasteland. I guess the most important factor uh, in the, let's call it the post-1967 evolution of Newark might be the change in leadership. There is one urban promise that I want to fulfill before I leave office. The state of New Jersey and the city of Newark deserve a world-class performing arts center. It's very easy to identify the initial key player. It was Tom Kane, who was then governor. He retained a consulting firm, a nationally known firm, to really take, do a study of New Jersey. And um, when the consultant came back and said, you need to put the thing in downtown Newark, uh, there was a whole lot of skepticism. You, like, you can't be serious. Nobody will come to downtown Newark. The place had a riot. You know, the whole litany of, of reasons why it shouldn't be done. See, as a young graduate student, I lived in one of the worst neighborhoods in New York City. It was called Needle Park. It was 72nd Street and that subway station, and uh, nobody wanted to live there, so the rents were cheap, and somebody like me, a graduate student, could live there. And uh, all of a sudden, I made the decision to locate Lincoln Center. And you saw the whole neighborhood change. You saw restaurants and stores and apartment houses and people on the street at night. And the drug dealers went away because it wasn't their neighborhood anymore. And I saw the arts, the arts transform a very bad urban neighborhood into really what's become one of the nicest neighborhoods in the entire city of New York. And that was my dream for the city of Newark. Many people claimed that the only way, the only place that that center would work would be a suburban Morristown. I think one of the more competitive sites was the Meadowlands. And those of us who knew that if it weren't, if it was not located in a city, preferably the largest city and the city with the best location in the state, New Jersey could kiss the cities goodbye. But Newark was decided on for a couple of reasons. One is the transportation network here is phenomenal. You couldn't recreate this. Four major highways, two major train lines, the airport, the heliport. It's perfect from that point of view. Secondly, there's just something about the arts that happens better in cities. It's where the energy is, it's where the diversity is. There's something about the mix of an urban setting that feeds the creative process. Hard to imagine a great art center adjacent to a suburban mall. I mean, frankly, and I can say this, I was born and raised in Newark, worked there for many years. Uh, the question that one heard all the time is, well, who's going to come to Newark? Uh, the city with this terrible image and reputation. There were scores of articles in, in local newspapers, New York Times especially, and much to my dismay, some New Jersey newspapers, which raised this question, well, if the center was built in Newark, will they come? You know, is this thing worth it? Is this thing going to serve the, the, the people of Newark? Uh, is this simply for the suburbanites? And not always it's a coded word, because suburbanites in New Jersey usually means whites. So the supporters of the Performing Arts Center found themselves caught between two highly charged negative perceptions. One, that the suburbanites will never come, and the other, that the center would only be for suburbanites and not the people of Newark. With criticism coming from all sides, it wasn't easy to find people willing to put their money behind such a risky enterprise. We are so proud to let the country know that we have raised over $100 million for a performing arts center in Newark and New Jersey. The other key player uh, 
in the very beginning was Ray Chambers, who was born in Newark and raised in Newark and has almost adopted Newark through his own philanthropy and his own foundation and his own uh, hopes for rebuilding Newark. I recall hearing about Governor Kane's proposal and then reading in the media that there was a lack of support from the private sector to have such a center in Newark. And with all the disappointments that the people of Newark had encountered over the last several decades, I felt it would be a shame if they also lost this opportunity. The art center could not have been built without an unprecedented, comprehensive public-private partnership. I think it defines a civilization when people get together as their first major public-private venture and focus on the arts. We think the Performing Arts Center uh, accomplishes a number of objectives. First, it, it obviously brings uh, the arts to the people of New Jersey, but importantly is a key ingredient in the revitalization of the downtown Newark area. Revitalizing a city means that the city has to be open all hours of the day, not just during the day for work, and to have people to come into the downtown area in the evening, we think is an important factor in the uh, rebuilding of Newark. We try to learn lessons from other cities who have attempted to revitalize downtowns through the arts. All the same things that are being said about Newark were said about Cleveland. Cleveland was a city that 25 years ago was really set back on its heels. Nobody would go downtown, there were no hotel rooms, there were abandonment. It was a difficult place. The river caught on fire, it was a joke. It didn't happen overnight. But in the course of 10 or 15 years, uh, an area of Cleveland uh, called uh, Euclid Avenue, uh, which was once the center of pornography and drugs, uh, now has a million people a year coming to theater. Not everybody in Newark was convinced that the Performing Arts Center would be the cure-all for the city. In American society, we always like the very glitzy uh, projects, you know, whether or not we try to do an aquarium or whether we try to do an art center or we do a museum of some sort. They're good projects, but they're not the anchor for economic development. We really have to put up, set our priorities, and they have to be our priorities. Creating jobs and training people. I believe it's about hope. I believe it's about the holistic approach to life uh, that our cities are not just mere reservations for the poor. I think the third person was probably Mayor James, who was sort of a walking chamber of commerce from Newark. Mayor Sharp James made the New Jersey Perform Performing Arts Center, and he did this, it was a politically risky idea, because there, there are other issues on Newark's table, but he made this, the, 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 if you will, the centerpiece of his vision of this new Newark arising from the ashes. I, when, when people say, well, there are more pressing things than arts, and I remember uh, that was Secretary Kemp uh, when I fought in Washington for a grant, and he yelled out, Mayor James, you ought to be ashamed of yourself that you're fighting for the Arts Center uh, in Newark, New Jersey. You should be about uh, the homeless. You should be about housing. You should be about the AIDS victim. What are you worried about those ballet slippers, about those horns, about the shame on you, Sharp? I would say to Jack Kemp that the lights on Broadway did not dim during the Depression. I would say to Jack Kemp that even while we were building with mortar and bricks, we need to save souls. The fact that you had a very politically astute a highly thought of uh, mayor, and most importantly, given the uh, racial ethnic dynamics of New Jersey, a black man saying that the arts are important to my city, the arts are important to my constituencies, that had a powerful effect on how the New Jersey Performing Arts Center was perceived. Keep in mind, by the way, that um this thing has gone through three governors, Kane, Florio, and Whitman. And <clears throat> despite the political differences and the party differences between the governors who have supported it, their support has been common and uniform right across the board. Your new center will revitalize downtown Newark and the Passaic River waterfront 
and you can take great pride in the fact that it is the result of a partnership between government, business, and the people. Initially it was, it'll never happen. Then when it became clear, it's going to happen, that's when it began to shift to, it isn't for us. They're going to have the London Symphony down there, but there won't be anything of particular interest to people who live in Newark. I think that's a very patronizing attitude, by the way. But it also took the form, nobody in Newark will be able to afford to go. The problem was again one of preconceptions. People typically assume that an art center is going to be an island of high culture for the privileged few. And the look of the building itself can often reinforce that idea. In thinking through the urban planning aspects of the art center, it was very important that we be not just in Newark, but of Newark. To weave the art center carefully into the fabric of the city. The art center is unavoidably an icon. And as an icon, you take on a certain responsibility. Was this going to be the Sydney Opera House? Uh, was this going to be the Kennedy Center? Uh, we had a different idea. Our idea was that the art center should be highly contextual. It shouldn't be something that you point at across the city, but something that fits comfortably within an urban context. You can see that the building is brick. It's glass. I don't think that a marble structure would have made it here. It was not the right feel. Newark is a city of broad shoulders like Chicago. It's steel, it's brick, it's ordinary people. We wanted to be part of the city. We, we felt that uh, performing arts is about entertainment. It had to be welcoming and inviting. And so rather than to be separate, we looked for clues on how the building could be monumental, but at the same time feel like it belonged here. There was a great craftsmanship here in the past and we wanted to reinstall that again. Uh, one of the really beautiful ideas, I think, is the big truss system that is the proscenium arch to the park. Uh, and people have said, well, it's reminiscent of the big bridge building that occurs here. And yes, it is. The, the building has to work both in the daytime and also at night. At night, it will be terrifically transparent. And we put a lot of emphasis on lighting. We wanted you to feel like this is a place that's welcoming and warm. You'll say, that's the place I want to be, or at least I want to go in and have a look and see what's going on there. So what's wonderful is that the city becomes the set for us. So we're the city audience in some ways, and the stage is the city. I've always felt that great lobbies really are great stages, uh, because we know that people not only come to see, but they love being seen. So you know, my, my role as the architect is to, is to choreograph uh, and reinforce the idea of the lobby as stage. The stairs, the bridges, the balconies, the boxes, each contribute to making a kind of theater, and it's a theater before you see the theater. It was also very important that the art center be built by the people in the community. Uh, we didn't want to import labor. We didn't want to import contractors. We wanted this to grow out of the community so that the community could feel really a part of it. We had very aggressive affirmative action goals. That job site was one of the most integrated job sites in America, integrated along the lines of, of, of race, ethnicity, class, and gender. In other words, the job site replicates the stage and replicates the art. The art, of course, is what we are here for. Yet even the art is shaped by the place where it's performed. And I can tell you as a performer the difference that good acoustics make. For me, it can be the difference between a good listening experience and a great one. It's tough enough to make a concert hall sound intimate and acoustically excellent for classical music. But what if you want great acoustics not just for the symphony, but for pop, jazz, and maybe a little klezmer? It's quite clear that with this tremendous range of events that, we book, that will be booked into Prudential Hall, we must have a variable acoustical environment. And uh, in, this, in this hall, the major devices uh, to get that adjustability 
The one is the way the concert shell works on stage and the, the eyebrow canopy that comes out into the, uh, into the audience chamber like sort of a, uh, an eye shade on a cap. When it comes on down, uh, the main part of that eyebrow canopy will lower gradually until it's basically horizontal and covering out over the first seven or eight rows of the audience. This eyebrow canopy is positioned so that the strings, the violins, the violas, the cello, and the woodwinds, the sound of those instruments is very efficiently sent into this main floor area. The audience often forgets that the sound that they hear at their seat is just a very relatively small part of the acoustics of the room. For the symphony orchestra, is acoustic one of the most important thing? And uh, this new performing arts center, the new hall, is very important for everybody. I mean, I I am waiting for four years. The, some of the musicians in the orchestra, they are playing in the orchestra for 25, 30 years. Uh, so they are waiting all this time. And uh, New Jersey Symphony Institution is waiting for 75 years. So finally now everybody get what, what they are waiting so long time. You know, when we moved with the same orchestra, with the same people, with the same music, okay. in this performing art center, okay. it will be like you polished the, uh, the diamond, you know, you clean it up. So you will, you will hear it from a different side or a different sound. What the New Jersey Performing Arts uh, Center has, has really made possible for us is to have a home, a brand new home, a second home, in a brand new theater. A theater that, that um, I mean, I walked into it and it already has its own warmth built in. Because we are the principal resident affiliate company here, um, th there's rehearsal space here for us. There is creative space here for us. I mean, I can make ballets here. You know, I can make ballets here. I can premiere ballets here. I can rehearse my company here. When that building was originally designed, it was one big performing arts center hall. As an increasing sensitivity about the reality of Newark began to find its way into the discussions, it became clear they needed to redesign the building. That's why there are now two theaters over there. The Victoria Theater, the small 500-seat facility, was put there as a way of addressing the concerns, the aspirations, the opportunities for the smaller cultural arts groups. It's true, there are a lot of good stories in our dreams. The smaller hall really lends itself to the other side of the vision, which is the community cultural center. It's the place where you know you're starting on a smaller level to develop smaller audiences that you hope will grow over a period of time into the larger spaces. Such a long time ago we started doing workshops and, and, and classes and helping put together the teaching curricula. In the, in the dance academy here. We were participating in that long before anybody else got interested in this, this, this whole idea of Newark and, and New Jersey being a mecca. After we built the Arch Center, Jack Kemp called me on the phone. And I said, Jack, are you calling to fight again? Are you calling to say that uh, we should not invest it in the arts? He says, no, save me a seat for opening night. Americans perceive the arts through a keyhole. That is to say, they see the arts as being something that should reflect their art. My point is that the Performing Arts Center has taken a careful look at what the 20th century has made of American people and, and what the 20th century has done for us. It has made all of us a lot more aware of the diversity of our antecedents. We are part European, we are part African, we are part Caribbean, we are part Latino, and the Performing Arts Center is inspired by that vision.
The reality is that people are now saying, wow, I'm proud of this. I think it will continue to be perceived as a symbol of the rebirth of a major city. He didn't ask for that role. Lincoln Center wasn't perceived as generating the relifing of New York. The building in Cleveland wasn't. But here, somehow, this is perceived as a symbol of the rebirth of Newark. It would be a daunting challenge for any performing arts center, carrying the banner for the hopes and dreams of an entire city. But that's what art does. It breaks down our assumptions about the way things are and dares to show us what could be. So I have no doubt that night after night, something astounding is going to happen on this stage. And I know that something astounding has already happened in this city. Funding for New Stage for a City has been generously provided by the Prudential Foundation, providing grants to nonprofit organizations helping individuals and communities build the skills they need to be ready to learn, ready to work, ready to live. This is PBS.